Welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Welcome to this special episode of This Just In Radio. We're broadcasting live from the Vive 2023 conference in Nashville. I want to thank Chime and DHI for inviting us to their theater. I'm your host, Justin Barnes. We have a terrific leadership roundup show this morning with Chime. The focus is always on the CIO and CSIO. So I brought together a great group of friends and Chime members to join us today. I look forward to all of them helping us wrap up Vive 2023 with just what some of the priorities are for the CIOs and also hopefully some of the conference highlights along the way. My first guest, Dr. Nan DeGrin, Dan DeGrin, Chime Board Chair and also CIO of Maine Health. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks so much, Justin. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. So how long have you been in town? Uh, since Saturday. Awesome. Uh, long, good stretch though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how's Vibe been for you so far? Vibe has been fantastic. There's just so much energy um, at the conference and so great to see all of the the uh, vendor of uh, uh, representation here spanning, you know, both innovative new young companies as well as more established ones. Um, and obviously all of the CIO and uh, CISO leadership that you mentioned. Um, so fantastic uh, speakers, um, presentations. Obviously, the entertainment here in Nashville is, is phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. Um, and so it's just been a fantastic uh, um, several days for us. Yeah. So, yeah, no, this is my first Vive, but um, obviously been a company conference for a long time, and the energy here is, un, is just unparalleled. I mean, people here, the thought leaders here, the vendors here, the innovators here, you know, as you mentioned, some of the people who are new to the market, but with phenomenal technology and innovation, and some people have been around for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, yeah. um, but still innovating and making a big difference. And so it's, it's what's here, it's phenomenal. And what, one thing that I really love about the event is is that it was pretty manageable. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, the right size um, walking from one end of the the show floor to the other is achievable with within you know a few, a few minutes got it and I also love the fact that uh, again some of those smaller uh, new entrants to the market are right next door to the to the you know more established ones and so it, it's a little bit of a leveling of the playing field which I think is important it's actually a very good point and and Steve uh, Lieber brought up yesterday on the show that um, they actually may limit it to say ten thousand or so. So we keep this intimate. We keep this, you know, at a, a nice high level. And um, to your point, you kind of level the playing field because some of the other conferences, you know, someone that might have a, you know, almost like a 80 by 80 booth and then you kind of drowned out that 10 by 10 innovator. So, but here kind of everybody's on a level playing field. It's a great point. Yeah. And not to mention it allows us to go to new cities that, uh, that we haven't had a chance to go to before. You got it. Now we'll make a plug for, uh, for Vive next year in LA. I'm very excited for that. Absolutely. So some, what are the top agendas? You as uh, the Chime Board Chair, what are some of the top agenda items for you guys this year? Well, certainly uh, continuing with the success of Vive is, is one of those. This has been a, a huge strategic priority for us as an organization. Um, you know, expanding internationally uh, is, is a very uh, big effort for us. Uh, our advocacy efforts uh, in Washington are uh, as important as ever. Um, and, you know, just getting back to the core mission of Chime, which is education of, of our health IT leaders, um, absolutely still top of mind for us and what we're focused on. You know, healthcare is undergoing a huge transformation now mm -hmm. with IT and, you know, some of the innovative new technologies that we're seeing all around us here. And that's, there's a lot to keep up with. And so I think Chime plays an incredibly important role at helping our leaders do that um, and, and getting them, you know, up to speed on, on all the new opportunities available to us. Absolutely. No, Chime's been around for many decades, great uh, leadership level, certainly for CIOs and CSIOs, but you guys are also, I know, branching out and spreading out for a lot of the top leadership within health systems and organizations. That's right. Yeah. So you have a very unique perspective as well, being the CIO for a main medical center in Maine Health. So tell us, I guess, from your perspective, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing either within your senior organization, not giving any inside strategy, but, um, but as challenges as the CIO? Well, I think, you know, one that is unfortunately a recurring theme with all of my colleagues that, uh, that I speak with is just the financial challenges that we're under. Uh, it's never as though, you know, we had buckets of money to play with, right. but, um, but things are as difficult right now as honestly I can ever remember them in my, you know, 25 plus year career. So, um, that's an incredible challenge because we're being asked to do more. 
um, in many ways, IT is the um, solution to some of these problems, right? Allowing us to be more efficient. And yet we've got to get there on a much, much tighter budget. Um, and so that's an incredibly uh, big one right now. Coupled with that is, uh, of course, the workforce challenges. Um, you know, in our post-COVID world, we're struggling to, to fill clinical roles, um, administrative roles, IT-centric roles. Um, flexible work and remote work has been a, a, a boon for many of us, but it's also meant that people have much more ability to, you know, take their skills somewhere else uh, and not move and uproot their families. And so that's, that's an ongoing uh, both opportunity and challenge for us. And then finally, the, the clinical community is, is really struggling as well right now. Yes. Um, doctors, uh, nurses, clinicians of all types are just burned out. They're, they're challenged to, again, do more, see more patients, um, do it with, with 80% of their, you know, pre existing workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's tough. And so when we layer on technology that's not optimized for them, that just makes the struggle even worse. So we've got to do everything that we can in our power to, to simplify the technology, remove those obstacles, and sort of help as best as we can. Yeah, most as a follow-up to that, I would like to talk about some best practices, but you are also being in Maine. I mean, that could be a little bit more unique with, like, how do you, are you doing incentives to bring people in, or you do have a, you have a large enough pool in Maine to pull from, or do you actually send people to move to Maine? Gorgeous state, amazing state. I'm actually from Boston, so I know Maine pretty well. Yeah, no, it, one thing we do have is our is our environment, our landscape. Yeah. It's, it's just beautiful, so we just need folks to come for a little bit, and yeah. then invariably they end up staying. Yeah, we're, we're, our, our health system is based in Portland, Maine, fantastic wow. city. Beautiful city. Um, and so, um, but yeah, it is uh, definitely a more rural state. Um, we have an incredibly strong team now, but um, recruiting is, is a challenge for us. So what are some of the best practices? I like to show my fo show focuses on key strategies and best practices for CIOs, but you know, C-suite executives to thrive, hopefully in healthcare. Um, what are some of the things that you might share with some of your peers, either they're maybe new to the CIO position or maybe new to healthcare, but they could be some great innovators from outside of healthcare coming in. But what are some of the best practices you would share with them from your perspective? For one, uh, I refer back to my clinical background. I think it's incredibly important um, if you don't, if you're not coming to the to the role with that background, you've got to make best friends with as many clinical folks as you can and immerse yourself in it. You can't do this job sitting in an office in an executive suite. You've got to understand the things that your customers essentially are going through. And so I think that's an incredibly important um, step that, that new uh, executives in their roles could take if they don't come to the table with that background. Um, and two is uh, is to to recognize that our roles are unique in that we we have to uh, collaborate with our peers. There's very, very little, if anything, that we can do on our own as technology leaders. We've got to partner with all aspects of the, the uh, health system um, to get things done. And so um, working in partnership is a really important skill, um, and it's something that you can actually work on. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it comes naturally to some folks, but not to others. And so I think understanding that and, and working on it is an important skill. And then finally, just to continue to educate yourself. Uh, healthcare Excellent. is a complex environment. Um, and obviously the technology within our systems are, is changing very rapidly. So things like Vive, th organizations like Chime um, are incredibly important to stay plugged into because I think that's where you get that education. Yeah, so as a follow-up to that really quickly, do you have a work group or another conference that you say, well, it's a must on your schedule or something that you plug into? Is there a work group within Chime or somewhere else in the organization, uh, it's in the industry that you plug into personally? Well, I think the Chime Fall Forum is an, an incredibly um, great, or, uh, great uh, experience and setting. Uh, many of the kinds of uh, um, educational talks that we had here at Vive multiply that times several uh, uh, fold at the, at the Fall Forum. So I think that's probably, for me anyway, the, the premier event that uh, I, I'm sure never to miss. Um, beyond that, there's lots of sort of technology-centric organizations um, out there, and they have their routine conferences. And I think, you know, tapping into as many of those as possible is, is always a good idea. Again, the, the financial pressures on us now are such that I know that many of my peers are having to limit what they go to right. um, just because of travel and, and conference expenses. So 
um, sometimes you have to prioritize. Excellent. Now, uh, chime fall form. Totally agree. I've heard that a few times now. So uh, very exciting. Dr. Dan DeGrin, thank you so much for joining us today. Great Thanks, to have you on the Justin. show. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. Welcome to the show, Chelsea. Thank you for having me. How are you? So is it Chelsea Arnone? In the old country, it would be. So I'll just I heard you on Monday saying that. <laughs> Arnone. Arnone. Director of Federal Affairs for Chime. So now we got some breaking stuff that we're going to talk about. Is that right? Cool. But before we get there, how's Chime? Or how's, how's Chime? How's Chime for you? How's uh, Vibe been for you this year? It's been fantastic. It's my first time here. I joined Chime in uh, June of last year, so it's wonderful. Very cool. And where'd you come from? I came from a, another company that's in healthcare. I've been in healthcare for about 15 years now. So, Excellent. So what broke this morning and what do you want to talk about? So what broke this morning is the implementation of the Patch Act, which was passed as part of the Omnibus last year. So the FDA uh, was instructed within 90 days, which is today, March 29th, um, to implement the provisions to require medical device manufacturers to provide certain cybersecurity items in their pre-market submissions. So they are now going to be held to a very high standard for providing cybersecurity S-bombs and um, certain, this happened, you know, literally at 845 this morning it was released. So we're not shocked and surprised. We are looking forward to it, but um, it is now in effect. Excellent. Fantastic. So you bring up cybersecurity. I know it's one of your main focuses. Um, what do you want to kind of share regarding that as some of your thoughts and what's happening with the White House releasing the, the, um, their first national cybersecurity strategy last week? Yeah, so they, it was actually a little bit earlier this month. The White House released this administration's first national cybersecurity strategy. We are, you know, absolutely thrilled that they're paying attention to absolutely. the critical infrastructure sectors. Um, it did not mention the HPH sector, ours, so it didn't mention it directly, but it's something that is, of course, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, they've been targeted greatly, our members, so... We are, um, you know, we were encouraged by that. And also last year, late last year, the Treasury Department indicated that they were considering a catastrophic cybersecurity coverage plan, sort of perhaps to be modeled after the National Flood Insurance Program. So we were uh, very supportive of a potential catastrophic cyber offering from the federal government. And we are paying attention to the implementation of the Sertia law, which is mandatory reporting from the critical infrastructure sectors, and that will be um, released sometime later this year, the proposed rulemaking. What's the um, touchback on the um, cybersecurity um, aspects with the uh, you know insurance backstop, all that kind of stuff? So it, the insurance marketplace for cybersecurity for providers is becoming, uh, it's no longer a soft market. Uh, I've been part of it, I know. So that's what I'm very yes. interested in that. So um, we, you know, for those that have, you know, been hacked and are uninsurable, right. they are, yeah. that this would be a great offering or opportunity for them. They're absolutely willing to go to get this. They're willing to meet all the needs, but then they are just denied and it's, cost prohibitive it's very expensive and it doesn't always cover it actually usually doesn't cover the full cost of an attack so if it costs 60 million dollars to a member mm -hmm. they'll cover maybe half of that so you talk about i know we, we've saw off the air a little bit data um, privacy the ftc enforcement of the health uh, breach information uh, notification rule talk about that a little bit so the FTC has authority under the health breach notification rule. They've had it since 2009, but they have not utilized it until this year. So we were encouraged by that. There's a lot of activity going on in the administration, paying attention to consumer privacy as a whole and very broadly. And of course, patients are consumers. So when it comes to that, we're, it's something we're absolutely paying attention to. And those sort of the wild west of health applications that are possibly having your sensitive health information, yes. then they need to um, keep it secure. And those that have not kept it secure will be uh, subject to fines, penalties, and then certain provisions and policies that the FTC deems appropriate. Okay, excellent. So I know we've got the um, annual inpatient perspective payment system IPPS rule coming up. What talk about that mega rule? Rolls off the tongue. It yeah. rolls. <laughs> it off just the tongue. rolls off the tongue exactly. It is one thing I can count on, yeah. sort of in DC, like death and taxes. <laughs> it is 
coming out generally the same time every year. It is an easy read, four to 6,000 pages exactly. uh, on how hospitals are going to get paid <laughs> and sometimes some fun surprises in there right. from CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare yeah, Services. So it. it's going to be probably within the next, I would guess, two weeks or so, and I will be heads down yep. in that and kind of figuring out what sort of, you know, promoting interoperability program requirements are coming out and what changes they're making there and any other, you know, fun surprises they may have. <laughs> Is, I assume TEFCA is be part of that, you would think, in some capacity? I think that that's going to be included in another massive rule from ONC okay. um, that we've been waiting on. It's been under review since September, meaning it's like imminent. Mm -hmm. So it could be out in the next couple of weeks as well, making my life really, yes. really fun and busy. Yeah. That's right. So anything on the interoperability front that you, you know, that you see coming down the pipe and from a regulation standpoint, regulatory standpoint, or what do you think? I think there will be pieces in IPPS that have to do with interoperability and increasing it. Okay. Um, potential, hopefully incentivizing it in right. a way that we agree with right. and, you know, reporting and meeting the PI program requirements and making it, you know, it's all part of like, there's lots of moving pieces here from different agencies. Absolutely. Um, what about uh, the public health emergency waivers and flexibilities? Anything new there? or? So the unwinding, it's officially the COVID-19 public health emergency. The administration Maze. indicated. Yeah, correct. It's over. COVID's over. So fantastic news. Um, it will be over on May 11th. So right. those waivers. Officially. Are, officially. <laughs> officially. So the waivers and flexibilities that were offered, um, uh, certain states may be applying for extended waivers, so yes. that, you know, we have a cheat California, sheet. I believe. Yeah, yeah, we have a cheat sheet on our website so you can, you know, where to find the latest from the agencies. Yeah. And sort Actually, of that I would love for my listenership. I get a lot of questions around that. So what? where can they specifically go? Is there a link? Is there an area on your website? Yes. we are. So our public policy, if you, they aren't signed up for our debrief, yep. email policy at chimecentral.org. We are always available to answer questions. We respond directly to that. All those emails goes right to our team, Mari and my coworker, Cassie, who's here with us. Mari, uh, my in, guest on Monday. Here. Mari, my our fearless leader. Hey. And we had a good time on Monday. So. <laughs> she, she's fantastic. Yeah. So um, they can find it on our website. It's free, available yeah. to anyone. Our members, hopefully, are checking it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, obviously, you guys are a phenomenal resource. So I guess in closing, what do you hope to – What are you, are you done with the conference today? And now what do you hope to do this afternoon or, or – finalize here while you're here on the floor i'm heading back to dc awesome so i've been here since thursday so i'm heading back to dc and i think i'm gonna have a lot of reading to do in the next couple of weeks so i should probably get some stuff done excellent chelsea our known director of federal affairs for chime thank you for joining me today welcome thank to the show so much for having me appreciate it. it take care safe travels thank you thank you david welcome to the show my friend thank you my pleasure to be here excellent so first of all Tell me, David Finn, Vice President AHIS, AHIT, all a great uh, chime. Um, tell us how the show's been for you this year. It's been fabulous. We we it's you know we went through last year, and I was here last year. Excellent. Uh, and you don't think it can get any better? And it's better. It it has been fantastic in terms of just uh, the discussions we're hearing in the cybersecurity pavilion, the traffic on the floor, uh, and certainly the panels and speakers on the stages have been incredible this year. Yeah. No, and actually, I want to make a make sure I make a plug for um, for LA next year. Vive LA next February. I think it's February twenty fifth or right around that time frame. So I'll certainly be there. I assume we'll be broadcasting live again, Roberta, um, from Vive in LA. So I'm very excited. So first of all, tell us about the Chime boot camps and for the CIOs and CISOs and CSIOs and all that. Well, the, the Chime boot camps uh, originated many years ago, and they weren't called boot camps then. They had a program called Information Management Executives. And, and oh, yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and so it was really, uh, the CIO was barely a title in healthcare 30 years ago when right. Chime was formed. In fact, it wasn't. And, and so as, it, as they came together to discuss the issues they were finding with bringing technology into healthcare, they realized that they needed, uh, you know, they needed to come together. Why, why rebuild the wheel, reinvent the wheel? And, and they started sharing and, and the IME evolved into really more of a boot camp situation. It's, it's a three and a half day, very personal and intense program and and what they discovered is well they can teach you some things 
what they can't teach you is is your network and who to call and all those things and that kind of bonding is what took place i think the last number i saw is they have over four thousand graduates now of the cio boot camp and and several years ago the cios got together and said it is getting really complicated in healthcare." And, and so we spun up these other organizations, security being the big one because of what's yeah. happening in the world. And, and we created a CISO boot camp modeled on the CIO experience, but focused on security executives. Yeah, obviously phenomenal supporter of that, but also the importance of collaborating with your peers, learning from your peers, learning from associations. There's so much happening. It's getting more complex as you, as you mentioned, and we've got to, we've got to learn continuously. So, yeah. and it takes more and more players. It used, IT used to be able to go do IT, but if IT is doing it without the clinicians, without the revenue cycle people, without patients, it, it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's not digital health. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of education, staying on top of the, the trends, but also, you know, networking and learning from my peers. Absolutely. You know, we, um, this is a Chime phenomenal organization, and, and we have several in the healthcare industry that we, you know, that create these work groups, create these opportunities for us to learn, to collaborate, lead, um, and just get better at our craft. And also, with the level of complexity and innovation technology and opportunity, it's just critical to all of our career paths. So, love what you're doing there. And what are some of the, you know, reliable reports saying about healthcare and cybersecurity? And, you know, did the pandemic see any different trends of cyber attacks in healthcare? Well, I, I, I will start with the bad news. Things are going to get worse before they get better. They will. I believe that uh, 2023 and 2024 are really going to be pivotal years for security, particularly in healthcare. We've seen a number of announcements come out of Washington, both from the White House uh, as well as the Health Sector Coordinating Committee already this year. And I believe with with the, the new National Cybersecurity Program that Joe Biden launched uh, uh, earlier this month and what we're seeing from Senator Warner's office and what he intends to yep. do, uh, there will be legislation and, and there will be requirements for the first time in, in health care around security. Uh, what we're... What happened in the pandemic is it took a kind of tenuous situation and it in in many sectors right. across the globe blew everything up. Uh, you know, the remote work, the remote care. We had to change the model of healthcare delivery, which changed the model of IT delivery, and it opened up the, the sector and it opened up new attack vectors, a, a magnitude of, of additional attack vectors. We had uh, temporary docks manning, uh, you know, hospitals that were tents in parking lots. Uh, We had visiting clinicians to help staff those emergent situations. And it it told us where healthcare was going, but it also told us we didn't have the security and privacy in place to go there yet. Right. No, excellent point. Now, a couple of my guests yesterday really hit on that, just... The level um, that we need to step up over the next couple of years, where these nation states, they're going to come at us, they're going to come at us more, you know, to be honest, unfortunately every day. And so we've really stepped up our game internally because we're going to get hit. And it's just a matter of when and then how do you handle it and, uh, and then rectify it. So you've been a hospital CIO uh, and security expert for a long time. So what are some of the priorities that you recommend to somebody new to this or just trying to become better? We always have to become better, and there will always be new attacks. And and the bad guys, unfortunately, are not constrained by budgets and taxes and uh, right. policies <laughs> like we are. But but some of the things are not as difficult as we we like to pretend they are, uh, and don't require as much money. But but it does require the effort. And I I think the big thing is just cyber hygiene. Healthcare is notoriously bad at patching and updating. Uh, hardware and software. We look at the legacy medical devices that some can't be patched, but there's other ways to address that that aren't necessarily investing in a whole new 
uh, medical device uh, inventory. Uh, the, the, the thing that kind of amazes me is we still don't focus on training and awareness. Right. Or if we do, it's not very good training and awareness. You, you get your onboarding security lecture, and then every year you have to take the online course. But, but training to be effective has to be personal, and it has to be entertaining. And that's the thing about security training. Anything you t- we teach you about security at your hospital – also applies directly to your own personal privacy and security. And, of course, what we carry now in our pockets uh, is, a f- is, is, a, is tenfold the compute power that landed men on the moon. Uh-huh. And, and we, we've got to think about that. There's so much processing. There's so much data. Your operating system is sharing data with other apps that we don't know about. And those are the things we have to start thinking about. Uh, and, and, and that's the story. And that doesn't always take a lot of money. It takes some time. But we have to focus on making people aware of what the risks and issues are. Excellent. If there's a work group or a forum or a show or something, where can someone engage? Where would you point someone to say, hey, join this, participate here? And you can get a leg up. You can actually learn. I know we talked about the boot camps a little bit, but is there something else in the work groups or any, any forums or anything like that that you say, hey, point, go there? You know, obviously I will, I will look to chime and a his first. Yep. But uh, there are, particularly for a, a lot of small providers, uh, and we actually have them in the, in the cybersecurity pavilion this year, uh, the uh, Health and Human Services Office of the CIO has a department called 405D, which, which is a section of the CISA Act of 2015. And, and they've developed uh, tools and training and education. They're about to launch a, a, a training for clinicians, uh, video training. And so you don't have to have a huge IT or security department, but, but this is material tra- developed by the government working with the private sector Hundreds of providers participate in these work groups, and it's an incredible source. Uh, the other areas, the health ISAC, uh, healthcare mm-hmm. and public health is one of the 16 critical infrastructures uh, defined under executive order. And so under the Department of Homeland Security, the CISA group uh, had to commission a private nonprofit called the Health ISAC, and they provide materials, they provide alerts, they provide vulnerability alerts and training uh, to security and non-IT and non-security people. So there's resources that were unavailable five years ago that you, you, it doesn't cost a fortune. You, you can choose to belong or not, but you can get basic information and share that through your organization. Love it, David. Thank you so much. A lot of great wisdom there. Thank you for that strategy. Um, David Finn. Thank you for joining us today, my friend. Thank you. Have a great rest of your conference. I will. Excellent. And that is a wrap. What a great show. What a great time. Thank you so much uh, to Chime for inviting us to the theater. My producers, Roberta, Greg Masters, Carol Flagg, you guys have been phenomenal and bring this all together. I'll be honest with you, all the kudos goes to them because I didn't do a whole heck of a lot but sit here and talk. Um, so you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. We'll do it again. <laughs>